Hi, this is Peter Beal, and I'm doing a short lecture on realism in European art. Uh, what I want to do in this lecture is provide uh, you with some visual uh, tools to think about um, the meaning of some of these uh, the points I'm trying to make in this um, in this course. And uh, I'm going to begin appropriately enough uh, with the study of realism in the art of Europe. This is a movement that is seen uh, r really from about 18. 30, 1840, maybe up until about 1860 or thereabouts. A good way to begin to think about realism, of course, is to consider the changing uh, uh, landscape of Europe and uh, to think about the ways in which, for instance, uh, the, the forces of, of urbanization in uh, Europe and the way in which technology, communication, transport is changing. Uh, the map that I'm showing right now gives some indication of just how rapidly uh, the the European setting, the social, economic, political setting has begun to change, particularly with the rise of large cities, London, Paris, Berlin, what have you, the increasing uh, network of rail lines that are beginning to uh, make Europe sort of a more cohesive uh, entity. Um, in a previous lecture, I talked a little bit about the forces that really uh, combine to make modernism, and this is uh, a good visual addition to that. Some points about modernism, I brought them up before, but uh, it's good to have uh, just a quick review. Uh, this focus on urbanism, industrialization, and mechanism, uh, mechanization is certainly important. And as I mentioned uh, before, this new attitude about science, and particularly in the, in the case of realism, this enthusiasm for what might be described as positivism, a focus essentially on those kinds of facts that can be demonstrably shown to be true, typically through empirical means, and which point to a kind of progressive model of science whereby we know more and more about the world every day. We can essentially say that we are building up knowledge uh, as, we, as we move along. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, there's certainly some uh, uh, problems with this, um, this view of the world, which the likes of Karl Marx and Darwin, and ultimately we'll see a little bit further down the line, Sigmund Freud, are uh, beginning to uh, call into question. In art, modernism presents itself in a few ways. One of the most important one is, uh, ones is the aspect of contemporaneity, essentially one having to be of one's time. This is a phrase that's uh, coined by an artist, Daumier, and it certainly becomes an uh, almost gospel for artists uh, in the uh, 19th century that we no longer can appeal to uh, the traditions of the past. We have to be thoroughly of one's time. And uh, as a kind of accompaniment to that, we see the idea of the avant-garde, this military metaphor of people scouting out the terrain uh, in advance. Um, another aspect that begins to emerge increasingly in the 19th century is a sign of modernism, art, uh, modernism in art is the idea of painting as surface. So no longer uh, do we follow that Renaissance paradigm of looking uh, into a window, as it were, into a fictional world, but instead recognition of the painting as an artifact, as a surface, as a two-dimensional object. That's, I think, uh, certainly important. I'm uh, putting toge together here a quick uh, quote here from the very famous uh, author, the poet Baudelaire, where he describes the painter of modern life. And um, the degree to which he emphasizes this sense of transience, this fleeting quality, that you, you just sort of skate along the surface of things. You look at uh, uh, the world as it, as it passes by. This is that uh, aspect of modernity that is most striking in, in the description of uh, Baudelaire. And, and I think uh, Daumier and his, his dictum there, to be of one's times, is, 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 is very, very clearly present in this. We see this, interestingly enough, in all kinds of uh, ways. For instance, even in this pretty old school painting uh, by Jean-Léon Jérôme, The Death of Caesar of 1867, this focus on historical specificity the attempt to, in a sense, re represent or you know copy or Im really imagine a sort of historical recreation of the specific settings of ancient Rome and the death of Caesar to give almost what it would have looked like uh, through a camera lens, I think, and remembering the camera's uh, 1839 invention uh, really revolutionized the visual arts. It's hardly surprising that, that art begins to move in this direction. Another aspect of realism that uh, is certainly present in, in many important works is this aspect of political uh, activism. And, and at this point, we can certainly move to Gustave Courbet, 
and uh, his contributions to the scene. Um, Courbet is a, a, a very uh, interesting artist in a lot of ways. He's a political provocateur, a artistic provocateur, and he very quite self-consciously set himself in opposition, I think, to typical artistic currents of the time. And in uh, the Stonebreakers in particular, Stonebreakers of 1849, we see a representation of, a, of, of two people working, uh, essentially crushing rocks, road mending in, in the uh, provinces in the rural areas of France. One a relatively old uh, man wielding a hammer, and the other uh, 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 we see a young boy uh, bent under the, you know, supporting, propping up this very heavy load of rocks in a basket on his knee. Corbet presents us with this kind of unadorned, unglamorized, unidealized vision of hard physical manual labor. The kind of labor, in fact, that uh, people in Europe were increasingly nervous about um, because of a wave of revolutions that had swept France and, and elsewhere in Europe in 1848. Um, this sort of new proletariat, especially the urban proletariat, but, but no less in, in rural areas as well, was seen as a, as a kind of threat uh, to middle class security. And there was certainly a sense of uneasiness with this wide income inequality and uh, harsh and even dismal working conditions for uh, the working poor. Um, there's a sense, I suppose, of guilt and uh, uh, even even outrage uh, that's um, you know created by this by this strikingly direct depiction of poverty the anonymous toilers uh, not glamorous not uh, in any way a, a, a desirable uh, a state um, certainly an odd uh, outcome in a sense of the the struggles for instance of the French Revolution which certainly would have been fresh in people's minds as they looked at this so Stonebreaker is a great example of realism and it's you know, ability to depict mundane details, mundane phenomena, very straightforward fashion, but often with an undertone of political activism. And here's a, a, a just a few details looking up close at the very, you know, unglamorized, straight depiction of the subject matter as we look at this um, painting in just a little bit more detail. In Gustave Courbet's Burial at Ornan of 1849, we see a, a a kind of almost ironic celebration of life in the provinces. Ornan is uh, his uh, hometown, Gorfe's hometown. And we're seeing this um, funeral on a monumental scale. It's presented to us again, a painting 10 by 22 feet, that uh, shows the ordinary provincial types of France gathered around essentially a hole in the ground. There doesn't seem to be a particularly strong presence of religion or, or religious consolation in any meaningful uh, uh, way. There's uh, people drawn from a, you know, almost, I don't want to say standard types, because Corbet depicted specific people from his own, uh, from this uh, uh, from his village, people that he knew, relatives, what have you. But there's a sense in which their ordinariness and their, you know, their mundane aspects seem most prominent. It, it's almost as if Corbet really just wants to show us you know what a funeral is actually like, minus the religious uh, apparatus. It's appropriate at, at this, uh, you know, when looking at this, to consider uh, Corbet's uh, statement: "I've never seen an angel. Show me an angel, and I'll paint an angel." And I think there are no angels um, particularly prominent in the burial or not. Even the crucifix uh, that's being held by one of the attendants of the funeral is remarkably distant uh, from the from the grave. There's, again, we're simply looking at a void, a, a hole uh, in the ground. So uh, Corbet uh, is, is a very, very influential figure. His uh, rough and, and uh, unpolished handling of paint, his unadorned, unidealized characters, his ability to, in a sense, present this vision of provincial life directly as we see it, uh, made quite a stir in the art uh, scene in France in the, in the 1850s and, and early 60s. A painter who was, uh, uh, actually let's just look at a couple of these details before we move on. Again, close-ups showing the, uh, again, straightforward depiction of, of these ca of these characters. Here's a, a, another painting by Courbet uh, depicting some of the almost surface effects that he was after. 
Um, another painter uh, that um, I think is worth a close uh, look in regard to realism is Jean-Francois Millet and his uh, image of the painter's painting of the Gleaners in 1857 shows us uh, perhaps a more idealized vision of rural life. Uh, three women are, are looking for stray pieces of grain, uh, uh, stalks of wheat, what have you, that might have been left over from the harvesters whom we can see uh, uh, in, the, in the background uh, right around here. They're, they're bent down almost like birds. There's something very natural about them and, and um, it's certainly uh, I, I think part of Mie's, uh agenda to, to in a sense present these people as, as creatures almost of the soil. But anybody looking at this would have been well aware of the circumstances of grinding poverty and, uh, and really uh, economic, especially economic and social oppression that these uh, French rural peasants would have endured. And so it's a, it's a complex uh, image as it is bathed in a kind of golden gleam, a kind of sense of sunlight uh, and, and warm haze in the you know, late August afternoon, but nevertheless also represents a picture of economic and, and, and social repression. So this is you know, part and parcel really of the, of the realist enterprise. Here's some details again of the, the, the wagons being loaded up with, with grain and people busy at work. You know, and, and here a close-up on those anonymous and, uh, and op oppressed rural poor. Daumier, Honoré Daumier, is a very, very important character in uh, the world of realist art. His uh, capacity for reporting uh, the facts of urban life is, is perhaps unparalleled, as we see here in the third-class carriage of 1862. And the sense of an arbitrary and artificial division between members of society is uh, aptly captured here. The third class carriage on one side, again, people probably returning home from a visit to the city and the market, uh, probably again rural poor, a mother nursing a child, an older woman, and a son asleep. And on the other side we see uh, perhaps people with more wealth, uh, certainly indicated by their dress, top hats, and what have you. And this artificial wall that separates the two seems to speak to uh, uh, a comment, uh, seems to be a comment on, on artificial social d divisions and oppression that results from that. Certainly oppression is at the heart of the painting of the Rue Transnonain of um, 1834. Here we have an episode, essentially a police brutality depicted via lithography, a very repertorial uh, uh, mode of representation. It's a, a very, very uh, uh, harsh and, and, and shocking image even as we see these different generations murdered through the brutality uh, uh, of, of the police. Now one of the most important influences on realism obviously is going to be photography. And uh, Daumier in his wonderful caricature here shows a famous photographer in the 19th century raising photography to the height of art. The direct capturing of images uh, like uh, we see here, this depiction of a hospital uh, in the 19th century, an operation in uh, Massachusetts, uh, gives us an idea of, of the this is early operation under ether around 1847, gives us an, uh, an idea of the documentary possibilities of photography and how it begins to change the rules really uh, for the visual arts. As, um, we see a uh, a new technology that in essence replaces that uh, realistic depiction of, of things that was so popular in, in the 19th century. So a good contrast here might be say between Rembrandt and his 1632 uh, anatomy lesson of, of Dr. Taub as opposed to the photograph of, of roughly 200 years later and I think some significant differences can be immediately seen. Now uh, I'm going to leave our discussion of realism at, at this point uh, uh, alone and, and in the next lecture I'm going to discuss the ways in which realism begins to segue into a new uh, era of modernism, one that's heralded by the work of Edward Manet in particular in his Dejeuner Solaire, a time in which art essentially begins to uh, comment uh, upon itself.